Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Georgetown's Calaris Conference on Intelligence. I'm Mike O'Hanlon from the Brookings Institution. I have the distinct privilege of kicking this off today and being part of the show throughout the day and being up here just after lunch with Bruce Rydell, my colleague from Brookings, who will be the uh, midday keynoter. But in the meantime, I want to just welcome you on behalf of everyone here and also briefly introduce what this day is about and then Provost Groves, who will then welcome you and welcome the other panelists and get things off and running. As you know, the title of this year's conference is Embracing Paradigm Shifts, Global Intelligence Trends Embracing Paradigm Shifts. And there are at least three big ideas in the course of the morning and afternoon. Big data is one of them. Public-private partnerships, multilateral collaboration, and counterterrorism are other themes that we'll hear about. And we'll have a panel dedicated roughly to each of those subjects. Uh, I want to just give a very brief word of admiration for this conference. I've been aware of it since the concept began about four years ago. Uh, it's remarkable to see the partnership between Georgetown and the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which uh, until a few years ago, under a different name, you couldn't even say those words out loud and we weren't even supposed to acknowledge the existence of such a thing. Times have changed. Uh, a lot of the work there is still secret and now it's the NGA, not the NRO. And uh, you know, other things have evolved and shifted as well. And, and so we have the director of the NGA here today who will be speaking shortly after Provost Groves uh, welcomes you all. And so I will now get out of the way and let that all happen. I want to briefly remind you that your provost, Professor Groves, is in the uh, math and statistics department, a world-renowned expert on survey methodology, written numerous award-winning books on that subject, former director of the U.S. Census Bureau, and without further ado, I present you your provost. Well, welcome to Georgetown. Thank you for coming. Great to see you here on a, on a pretty day. Um, we are delighted, I can tell you, at Georgetown to partner with uh, NGA in, in hosting you for what I am sure will be a, a stimulating uh, gathering. I want to take a minute to note that events like this just don't happen by themselves and there are, there are three people that deserve our thanks and I, I, I hope you will join me in that. One is uh, Elizabeth Grimm Arsenault, uh, General Jim Dubik, and Connie Heiss and uh, we owe them a debt of gratitude. So I mentioned that we treasure this partnership with NGA and, and there, there, there are three reasons for this in my mind. One is in the true spirit of Georgetown devoted to intergroup interaction, dialogue, uh, discussion, uh, this is an intersectoral meeting that uh, will help us all. We'll learn from those who are not in our particular bubble. Uh, secondly, this focus on change, how we live in a world with dramatic changes happening every day and old institutions, even old institutions like this, have to be much more nimble than they ever were before. And then finally, uh, this uh, attention on new sources of information, new sources of data, which is uh, an obsession here at Georgetown as we build uh, a massive data institute and support our researchers, mainly in the social sciences, examining how new data sources from social media and other platforms, especially unstructured data, might be used in conjunction with more traditional information sources to gain greater insight in what's happening in this world. So uh, that focus of you today is something that is, is dear to our heart. We're also interested, given our heritage here, of addressing somewhat of a dilemma in this world we're moving into, and that is, can we achieve increased privacy and increased security at the same time? So we have an active group examining 
from multiple disciplinary sources, notions of digital ethics and, and data ethics, and so we're happy to see you here to, to uh, further that discussion as well. I uh, wish you a wonderful meeting. I, I, uh, I treasure the list of speakers you're going to hear, and I welcome you to this campus. I, I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you for coming. As I said, we're pleased to partner with NGA on this conference once again. And in that regard, I'm proud to introduce Robert Cardillo, the, a graduate of the Georgetown National Security Studies Program and director of NGA to introduce the keynote speaker. Thanks for coming. Um, it's great to see you all here. It's uh, great for me to be here. I half jokingly people uh, have jokingly say this is a little bit like recess for me because uh, I'm out of the building. I'm away from my desk and in the inbox, and I get to have uh, conversations, um, you know, beyond our walls and beyond our our community. And so I really look forward to engaging in that conversation with you all today. Uh, but first, a few thanks. Again, uh, thanks to Dr. Groves, uh, Mike O'Hanlon, um, uh, and everyone involved uh, in making today possible. Uh, and of course, the Claris family and uh, Tom Claris, uh, who endowed this foundation that makes this conference possible. And of course, uh, as you just heard, uh, this is a partnership. And we're pleased to be partnered with Georgetown. It was some 30 short years ago that I sat in a tent over on that side of the quad outside the building um, to receive my master's degree uh, from Georgetown in National Security Studies. And so uh, we have much uh, in common. We're both uh, seeking to develop women and men uh, who are responsible and active participants in civic life, which is why I presume you're here. Uh, we're both interested in lifelong learning. Uh, we both want to challenge our teams to th uh, think critically about the future, about the uh, risks uh, and the challenges and the opportunities. Um, so uh, for all of that, the partnership make great, makes great sense to me. Uh, not the least of which, too, is that we have not just myself but other uh, alumni uh, from Georgetown in the, on the team at NGA. And I always like to uh, remind uh, captive audiences like this one that we're very proud of our, our intern program. Um, uh, I think the window is open now, uh, nga.mil, uh, uh, for next summer's uh, class. And uh, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. It's a competitive opportunity, of course, but a wonderful opportunity should you have interest and finding out uh, what the mission is about while you continue your studies. Uh, and beyond that, we have many uh, full-time members on Team NGA that have joined uh, us at NGA. So let me talk a little bit about the world as I see it before I invite up uh, Eric Schmidt from the New York Times to continue the conversation uh, with me and then with you. Uh, but suffice to say, uh, we find ourselves in quite uh, an interesting uh, global landscape. Um, and we could, we could touch any part of that globe and talk about both the challenges and the opportunities that exist. For my profession and for my agency, uh, it imposes a particular responsibility, one in which we need to apply our capabilities in ways that inform those that rely upon us, those, those are the decision makers that need to understand threats and opportunities uh, but we also need to be able to um, evolve and modernize our profession in a way that accommodates the realities of the technology development of the world, of the flattening of the landscape with respect to capabilities, because uh, when I did uh, receive my diploma from Georgetown, uh, the United States was in quite a different place with respect to capabilities. We had a near monopoly. Uh, on assets um, and, and capabilities. And when you're in that position, uh, it's quite different to be valuable or to, to have a value proposition because you have something 
that no one else has, and so advantage is not that elusive. Well, fast forward 30 years, and those technologies that used to be exclusive are now becoming more and more common. And so our challenge has changed from one of unique position to more common access. And our challenge then becomes how do we adapt and evolve and apply capabilities that are more available in ways that continue to provide advantage to those that depend upon us. Um, we're both a combat support agency and a member of the intelligence community. Um, in the first role, uh, we try to ensure that when U.S. forces are engaged with an adversary, uh, we make the fight as unfair as possible. Uh, we try to provide advantage and insight and, and, and understanding uh, to help inform movement, navigation, uh, pre precise positioning, et cetera. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, and I think Eric and I will talk about this a little bit, uh, when we are tasked by a lead federal agency, in this case the Department of Homeland Security and within the department, the Federal Emergency Management uh, Authority Agency, uh, FEMA, uh, we can apply our capabilities in, uh, in support of uh, natural disaster recovery. So with her, uh, uh, the remnants of Harvey and Irma on everyone's mind, um, we're proud to have been able and, and to be able as I speak uh, to contribute as well to understanding, insight, uh, and a whole different role, and this one being of recovery. And so in this case, our customer are first responders uh, who would be uh, advantaged by knowing where to provide aid, uh, how to uh, reopen lines of communication, and how to uh, move uh, recovery most quickly. Um, the other piece that uh, I'd like to talk with you all about today is how we're engaging with this new uh, commercial technology. I talked about the era when the government uh, had an exclusive access to such technology. And so it's up to us now to, take, uh, to seek partnerships in non-traditional uh, ways. And we're doing so uh, both through kind of the uh, standard government contracting practice, but we're also looking to see if we can't as well set up what uh, we're calling a public-private partnership. And, and I'll just say here at the outset, uh, the broad the proposition is we have data sets, labeled data sets that are decades old, uh, that we know have value for those that are pursuing artificial intelligence, computer vision, um, um, uh, algorithmic development to automate some of the interpretation that was done strictly by humans in my era of being an analyst. And so that partnership is one that we're discussing with the Hill now to see how we can do it fairly uh, and openly. So uh, with that as just a scene setter, I'll finish again with thanking Georgetown and Calaris uh, for enabling us to continue this conversation and this partnership. Um, I'm going to invite uh, Eric Schmidt to the stage now, and we'll uh, wander in that direction and continue our conversation. Uh, but thank you all very much for joining us here today. Eric. Thanks for, uh, thanks for hosting this, this great event. It's been obviously 16 years since the, uh, since the attacks on 9-11 on here in Washington and New York, and I thought it'd be a good opportunity if you could help maybe drill down a little bit on a theme you just touched on in your, your opening remarks, and that's really the, the, the public-private partnership as it applies to D NGA, and, and really what are some of the examples uh, that you've done in working in that partnership how it either benefits the warfighter downrange, sure. Iraq or Syria, or as you kind of touched on a little bit, some disasters here in the United States. Sure. So let me uh, take that high level value proposition, go down one, and then uh, hit on an example or two. So he he here's the, the situation as we see it. Um, when I look at NGA and I look at what we have much of, um, 
we have experience and expertise. We've been in this business for a long time of observing the planet, understanding the meaning of uh, remote sensing and applying that in ways that advantage those that we serve. That's created a really rich data set uh, that we have in our government uh, archives. As we interact with this growing community that's seeking to take advantage of the Internet of Things and big data, uh, et cetera, to create consumer insight, right? how to increase sales or value propositions for a commercial company, I see a way that we can take what we have much of, right, that expertise, that experience, and that data, and maybe level it with something that we don't have as much as we'd like, which is the, the high-end computer science, the cutting-edge algorithmic development, the, the leading um, researchers on the artificial intelligence front. But we do have something of value as well, so maybe we can make a trade, okay, that our historical intellectual property, if you will, and their current cutting edge property. And, uh, and again, it, it still is a proposition. I, I continually have to caveat that uh, I'm working with my friends on the Hill to make sure that this is all done um, uh, in a fair and open way. Um, on the example front, Eric, um, I can think of many. So uh, even though we didn't call this a public-private partnership, I think this, this applies. So about two years ago, uh, we were uh, tasked uh, by the White House uh, to apply our sensing capability to provide a better understanding of the Arctic. And what we did was we used uh, our contracts that we had already on in place with a U.S. commercial imagery company, in this case Digital Globe, to use their assets to, to image uh, the Arctic in a way that it had never been done before. We then worked with University of Illinois, University of Minnesota, Oak Ridge National Lab to process the data in a way that would create um, an elevation matrix. The reason that's valuable is that if you're a hydrographer and want to understand the impact of a change in ice flow or ice presence, or if want to understand safety of navigation through sea lanes that weren't open in those months before, you have to have that baseline data in order to run the algorithm that you've developed. Now in this case, we posted it on the World Wide Web, NGA.mil, still there. The data set can be downloaded by anyone who, who wants to use it. We've been able to advance our understanding through scientific application of that data set what's happening in the Arctic. And by the way, I'm not here to tell you why it's melting. Okay, that's not my job, but it is. Uh, and so my job is to tell you what the implication of that melting ice is on navigation and resource competition, et cetera. So I think that's one example of where we had data. Uh, we ended up sharing it, not trading it in that case. But I think we could do that in other parts of the world and food security, uh, disaster relief. Of course, we'd be interested in applying it to advantage our military if we could as well. Now, we've also seen, obviously, people here in this audience just with their smartphones mm -hmm. have an amazing tools at their disposal, and we've seen that uh, just in terms of the information they have at their fingertips. How has NGA used open source material? Mm -hmm. Is it kind of blending that with the, the high-end classified stuff? Again, whether yeah. it's to aid the warfighter in developing plans or tracking insurgents or perhaps missile launches by different countries or, or other yeah. things that are keeping you busy these days? Yeah, so we're, we're treading carefully here, right? Because, you know, I, I've mentioned a couple of times, combat support is a, is a you know, highly important mission and, and not one that anyone should pursue casually. Um, with my intelligence community hat on, I, I, I always, always need to be mindful that what I share today could put at risk my ability to do my job tomorrow. This is what we call sources and methods. And so sometimes we have to, well, we always need to be very careful as we engage in, in the kind of opportunity you just described, Eric. Having said that, uh, we have a number of initiatives in place um, uh, to experiment with crowdsourcing. Um, um, some in the audience will be familiar with a, a consortium online called OpenStreetMap. 
Um, it, it's a coalition of the willing in which people contribute their insights locally, usually via smartphone, about road access, uh, infrastructure, um, and, and, they, and they have campaigns within that community to focus effort, for example, on disaster relief. Um, we are pursuing uh, a like capability to bonus off that type of approach. Um, uh, we call it GNOME, uh, NGA Open Media Enclave, um, Mapping Enclave, um, uh, in which we're trying to take the principles of crowdsourcing and, and in this case, doing it in the open to help us in areas that perhaps we don't have as much um, access. So uh, one example I like to give is we applied the, our GNOME approach to Nigeria. And the intent was to help understand their infrastructure better so that we could help them with their planned polio vaccine campaign a year from now. Um, it was quite successful. Um, now we'll see as the campaign rolls out, but we were able to um, provide information that led them to be more particular about the planning for that campaign. And one would hope get to more people, provide more inoculations. Now, NGA has become more of an expeditionary uh, agency, as I'm sure the many agencies in the IC have had since 9-11. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about what kind of support your folks sure. downrange give. Uh, Sure, so, so uh, our headquarters is about 30 minutes away in Fort Belvoir, uh, down near Springfield, Virginia. Um, uh, about 50% of my workforce in total uh, is there. Uh, one quarter of the workforce is based out of St. Louis, Missouri. It's a legacy of the Defense Mapping Agency, but fully part of our NGA family. Uh, the quarter uh, that I haven't mentioned is the one you just uh, referenced. So the rest of the team is out, and they're with customers, and whether they're with customers in Kabul or Baghdad or Djibouti um, or Tampa, Florida, well, as they move back to Tampa, Florida now, uh, post-evacuation, um, because, uh, one, we, we, we must provide dedicated, tailored support at the point of use in very particular cases. Um, two, though, we're able to cycle through our teammates with those customers to, to bring that expeditionary mentality back to headquarters. So it's a, it, I, I think it's uh, the right mix of rotation out, get that online experience, um, get refreshed with that customer view of the world, then bring that back to headquarters. I'm just thinking of examples of just in the last year where imagery analysts has proved so important. Obviously, President Trump's decision to carry out the airstrikes mm -hmm. against certain airfields in Syria after the, uh, the mm -hmm. use of chemical weapons right. uh, would seem to be a, a good example of where your agency must have played a very important role in pulling together in a very tight timeline uh, some, some products that were we yeah. present at the highest levels for decisions like that. Yeah, so a couple of things, uh, Eric. So I mentioned briefly in the overview, we're proud of our responsibility to provide, to ensure a safe na navigation. Uh, that's a role that we're, we're, we're legislated to provide to the Department of Defense, but because the Department of Defense tends to go all over the globe, we have to cover the globe. And so whether that's aircraft or maritime, uh, we s support that. We work with the Air Force to make sure GPS works. Uh, many of you are using the signal from GPS uh, and you will use it later to either get home in an efficient way, et cetera. Again, we don't fly that architecture. We just have the mathematicians that understand exactly where that satellite is and, and what time it's emanating its signal so that you are getting the best information you can about your positioning. You mentioned uh, weapons. Uh, I like to say that we make them smart now. That's probably a bit of an overstatement because there's a lot of people that wrote the code that goes into the, uh, that weaponry as well. But, it, it, but at the end of the day, um, it's the ability to precisely position so that when we get uh, the decision to employ US force anywhere in the world, you wanna make sure that it goes where it's intended to go and it doesn't go anywhere else and that if there's concerns, and there almost always are, with respect to collateral damage, that we're, we're 
as carefully and precisely positioning those weapons uh, as well as we can. You uh, obviously worked very closely uh, with the White House in the last administration. President Obama was a, a voracious consumer of intelligence, as I think most presidents probably are. Talk a little bit about how this president and his team uh, are any different in how they look at this, what kind of questions they're asking you and your team. So again, I'm, you know, my experience was 10 to 14, 2010 to 14, so I, uh, I think I should caveat it by saying I came in and you know, the, towards the end of their second year um, we're experiencing the first year. And so I do think there's something to a first year um, uh, for any team coming on board. Um, and I also have to caveat that my experience isn't as direct as it was. But uh, the reflections that I see, Eric, um, uh, one, uh, are respectful of the profession, and I mean the intelligence profession, this is not an NGA thing. Um, Highly inquisitive, okay, so it, which makes sense to me. How does that work? How do you know this? Well, you know, why couldn't this be? And so I think there's a, there's a healthy exchange of information and then let me look under the hood a little bit so that I can have some confidence in what you're telling me. Um, uh, just coincidentally, we were privileged to host Vice President Pence at our headquarters yesterday and we had 90 minutes, I think, of exactly that. We were just trying to show him how we did what we do. So at the end of the day, he could have more confidence in, you know, when it gets tense and the crisis, you know, and that NGA seal comes into his desk, oh, okay, I, I have a better feel for how this works. So what, what did he ask? What were the kind of things he wanted to know about? Yes. Um, uh, you know, I mean, look, uh, I, I, would, I would characterize it as, um, um, high interest, um, highly appreciative, I mean, uh, uh, with respect to just thanking the people that do the work. We tend to work behind the scenes, and so that was, that was good for the team. Uh, but I, I will say that, you know, spectral science all right, is not always as straightforward as one would seem. And so um, because we do a lot of our analysis that's the result of an algorithm, that's the result of a certain, you know, uh, uh, you know filter on a sensor that might not be literal. Um, uh, there were a lot of questions about, well, tell me how that works, or can I, you know, take a peek behind the, the white lab coat that created that, that insight. So, uh, so again, inquisitive, uh, interested, and appreciative. Uh, we obviously have an audience here that uh, some of your employees here are studying, as well as per potential recruits. Talk a little bit about uh, the workforce, kind of what kind of uh, people you're looking for yeah. in the future, what kind of talents, and how you're able to, what challenges you face in retaining people who might be, sure. be looking at very attractive offers in the private sector. Sure. Um, the business that, that we're privileged uh, to be in, uh, I would say when I joined it, was properly called an art and a science, right? Um, there's the, always is that, that intellectual core, that curiosity, that pursuit of understanding that's, that was existed then and exists today. I'd turn the phrase around today though, it's a science and an art, okay? So both are still needed, but what we're finding is that we do need to gain access, and that doesn't always mean hiring, it can be partnering, it can be, uh, public-private partnerships and the like. It can be academic partnerships with um, uh, the people that are pursuing the advanced science and, and uh, the, how to create return on the investment in big data, et cetera. So you will see us with more um, coding initiatives, uh, hiring data scientists and the like. We're well aware that should Google be interested in the same person, we are not gonna be able to compete with the fiscal remuneration. Um, we get that. Uh, we like to say we, ha we do have some psychic income that we can offer, you know, that, that sense of mission and that sense of, you know, uh, uh, of, uh, of dedication uh, to something. Uh, uh, by the way, nothing against Google and their pay scales. I'm, I'm happy they have them. Um, and I'd also like to say too that uh, I think in the future my career 
you know, joining the Department of Defense in 1983, you know, retiring someday, you know, from the Department of Defense after a 30 plus year service will be less and less the norm. Uh, I think we need to be accommodating of a stint at, uh, at a commercial uh, company, a move into government for some time, exchange of, on sabbaticals to schools and vice versa. So people coming and going. Yes, in and out. I think that should be much more the norm. Mm -hmm. We've got a few minutes for questions, so uh, I think there's a microphone floating around here somewhere. If, uh, if you want to ask a question of the director, uh, just raise your hand, I'll call on you. Please identify yourself and, and do have a question mark at the end of your uh, question. <laughs> yes, down here in the front row. Way up front. Way up front here. You can stand up, man, if you don't mind. Thank you. Thanks for your presentation and, and uh, moderator. Uh, my name is Li Yang. I heard that Dr. O'Hellen and, and uh, this panel about a PPP. Mm -hmm. And I'm very much concerned. I'm not saying that you cannot use the talents of the private sector, or the private sector use the government funding, mm -hmm. but I'm very concerned about abuse, mm -hmm. because I'm sure the example of the Rockwell uh, Town Center development, this mm -hmm. misuse, abuse of mm -hmm. PPP, and then probably you can also see the privatization of the jail the mass incarceration. Okay, let's let, let, let's let the director respond, ma'am, if you don't right. mind. So I just wonder if no, you can really clarify, I, yep. rather than being abused, that we can really promote the talents. Sure. I, one, I appreciate your concern. And the reason why I caveated my response to Eric earlier about we're having the discussion now is because your concern is on the table and that we want to make sure we're doing this in a transparent way so that people can know what is being exchanged and, and you know, make sure we have the proper protections in place against any abuse. And so uh, all I can do is assure you that your question is being asked of my team now uh, by uh, all sides to make sure that, that your, your worry does not come to fruition. So I, I, what I commit to you is to continue to pursue this transparently and so that, uh, and, and if I could just say one more thing, the, the data that I'm talking about is data that, that the U.S. taxpayer has already invested in. So it's, it's, it's essentially your data or our data. Um, as I said earlier, we need to be careful about how and what we, we do it, but that's why we're having the conversation now. So um, I, I, I'm not happy you're concerned, but I, but I, but I, we are well aware of the concern, and we're we're working hard to make sure uh, that that does not occur. Question right in the middle here. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Director Cardillo. Uh, my name is Monplazi Hamilton, and I read recently in the Washington Post an article about. Uh, the clearance process mm. and the backlog. So, you know, if we think of the intelligence community as a system, yes. to get access to the system, you need to go through this clearance process. How is this challenge of having a backlog hamper your ability to attract the talent that you're looking for? Um, th thanks for the question. It's, it's an existential threat to my profession. And please don't take that comment that I don't believe we need to do background investigations and we need to understand who it is that's joining the team. Of course we do. But I gotta tell you, you know, Eric brought up the, well, company X could pay more. Well, company X can also bring you on sooner, right? Uh, look, uh, graduate, any, most graduates, right, leave school with that diploma and debt. Right? And I presume this room is, uh, resembles that remark. Um, every month that goes by that you're waiting for one more form and one more review and one more whatever is a risk for you. And so 
even if you did want to accept my offer for that mission and that you know psychic income and whatnot, you know you can't wait forever. So I know we lose people today because of that. Now, I, look, this is a director of national intelligence issue, and by the way, Secretary Mattis is involved here too. You want to talk about somebody that's frustrated with the backlog? Uh, I think I put him at the top of the list. So we've got the right interest. Um, um, I don't know what the fix is. I will say long term, we've got to, we need to evolve from the one time deep dive, give you 18 interviews to what I think the financial services industry does, which is continuous evaluation. Look, there's, there are ways that, that we can, we can um, um, better understand risk that, that don't involve an interview once every five or six years. And so, so yeah, uh, it's, it's a threat and we must be much better at it. The uh, last thing I'll say though is that we are exploring opportunities to where I can work with you, both whether you're an academic institution or a commercial or maybe even a government employee without a clearance. I think we have to think about that and I think we have to have that uh, in our future. So, um, so anyway, I think that's part of the answer as well. We've got time for one more question. Just one way in the back there. Okay. Just wait for the microphone, if you would, please. Hi, uh, Director. I, um, I'm, my name is George Hennon. I've been supporting acquisitions from the vendor and the customer side for many years. And I'm wonder you used the term fair and open mm -hmm. multiple times in your comments. I was wondering what, if there's any kind of strategic direction that you plan on taking uh, the NGA specifically, mm -hmm. which makes it more fair to the government and the taxpayer. So uh, another initiative that we, we do have approved now, um, it's as only the government can do, it's a very long acronym, uh, but it's cyborg. But all I really want you to know is that we are now leveraging GSA um, uh, services so that, and what we do is we post our requirements and we, and we list those and, and those are open to everyone and then uh, companies, vendors, then apply to GSA to be um, um, eligible uh, to compete or to, 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 to satisfy those services. Uh, I'll forget the number now, but we have uh, a couple of dozen companies that have now registered, more that are going through the process, and, and so it's, it's, the, it's the epitome of transparency. It's, it's all there, and it's not What's competitive about it is now you know what the services we need. You have a price, um, um, you know, at which you'll meet the certain services, and we can do transactions much more simply. Um, we're ramping up our investment in that as one way to try to lower the barriers to four or five year multi, you know, billion dollar uh, contracts that that are necessary but tend to be pretty self. Uh, limited uh, with respect to access. Uh, we're also very proud of our small business uh, office and our outreach there in which we, we try to, well, we specifically set aside funds uh, to make sure that we're at least gaining access to companies that, that, you know, aren't the most traditional of ones, which, again, I should say are great partners as well. But uh, we are trying to lower the barriers on both sides. Thank you. Director, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Let me uh, please ask you all to join me before we break for 10 minutes in thanking the director and Eric Schmidt.